Uh, welcome to our machine learning seminar, uh, which we are hosting together with um, Elisa. Uh, so please, Elisa, could you introduce the, the speaker today? Sure. Um, so today we have uh, we are hosting a Vladimir Despotovic, um, who is a research scientist at the Bioinformatics and AI Unit in uh, the Luxembourg Institute of Health, uh, which he joined in 2022. And previously he wo he worked at the University of Luxembourg and at the University of Belgrade and Paderborn in Germany. His background is at the intersection of biomedical signal and medical image processing and machine learning. And now he works on the development of digital health solutions with the emphasis on digital and computational pathology and audio-based medical assistive technologies. So um, with that, uh, we welcome our speaker and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Elisa, for a very nice introduction. I will just share my screen. So I hope you can see it in a full screen mode now. Yes. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at the machine learning seminar. It's already my second time. So I was with the Agato machine learning seminar around maybe three years ago. And the topic of my uh, talk today will be a little bit different. I will be talking on our latest results in the field of uh, AI driven uh, digital pathology. So let me just give a brief outline of my talk. I will briefly give uh, my personal background and uh, background of the group where I come from. Then I will provide some introduction to uh, whole site uh, imaging, which is a major imaging technique used uh, in digital pathology. Then I will talk about in more details about the methods that are used ranging from uh, supervised learning to multiple instance learning, uh, contrastive and non-contrastive self-supervised learning, and also multitask uh, learning techniques. Uh, and then I will present some of the results uh, in uh, different use cases uh, that uh, we have, uh, such as tumor subtype prediction, tumor segmentation, or molecular profile prediction. And finally, I will end the talk uh, with some ideas for future work uh, and also uh, emphasizing some of the uh, unresolved challenges uh, in the digital pathology uh, community. Uh, so, as you said, I'm a research engineer at the Bioinformatics and AI unit of the Department of Medical Informatics, and we are a group of uh, how many nine researchers uh, here working uh, at the interface of uh, two fields, so bioinformatics and uh, artificial intelligence fields, uh, where in bioinformatics we work with different types of omics data, transcriptomics, genomics, epigenomics, proteomics, uh, and uh, my background is more on the AI side, uh, where I work on biomedical signal processing and medical image analysis, mostly in the domain of digital pathology, but also at the intersection with uh, multi-omics and uh, clinical data. Uh, and we also have two group members that are members of the multi-omics data science group at the Department of Cancer Research, and the group itself is led by Dr. Peter uh, Mazzaro. Uh, so just a brief introduction to digital or computational pathology, which is a specialist field within pathology that involves uh, digitization of uh, traditional glass slides, tissue, tissue samples, and the other pathology specimens. And here we use advanced imaging techniques such as whole site imaging to create and analyze extremely high resolution digital representations of uh, histological slides and specimens. Uh, and here we can see the, how the entire process going uh, go from uh, uh, taking the tissue specimens for either uh, human or, or uh, uh, animals, uh, usually during the surgery, then uh, this is uh, fixed in uh, profile to preserve the uh, tissue characteristics and embedded in paraffin to uh, obtain the so-called FFP blocks. FFP stands here for formalin fixed paraffin embedded blocks, which are then 
uh, sliced into very uh, thin uh, sections of uh, uh, several micrometer thickness and further stained in order uh, to emphasize certain cell characteristics. And here we mostly work with uh, hematoxylin and uh, eosin staining, uh, uh, which uh, dyes uh, cell nuclei in purple and cytoplasm uh, in a pink core. And then this is put on a glass slide, which can be either observed under the microscope or can be scanned uh, using the whole slide image scanners in order to obtain these high resolution, uh, resolution images, which uh, obviously cannot be processed uh, uh, entirely, but need uh, to be divided into small parts, which are known as uh, patches or tiles. Uh, so with these, we get images which uh, can have resolution uh, of up to 150,000 times 150,000 of pixels, uh, and uh, each image can occupy several gigabytes of uh, uh, storage space. Uh, and these are also hierarchically stored at different uh, uh, magnification levels, uh, where at uh, lower magnifications we can capture more context, but at the lower resolution. Uh, and this is more for uh, microscopic observations at the tissue level. And then at uh, higher magnification of, of, for example, 40, 40 times magnification or up to 100 times magnification, we can get uh, a smaller context, but this time at higher resolution to observe uh, what happens at the cellular level. Uh, so, AI can be used in uh, different applications in digital pathology. It can be used for automatic clinical diagnosis, for example, for tumor subtyping or tumor grading. Uh, it can be used for tumor detection and segmentation to uh, uh, annotate the areas where tumor might be located. Or it can be used for molecular profile prediction, for example, in some uh, uh, tumor types, there are known genetic alterations uh, that uh, uh, can be uh, captured using the molecular profile, but unfortunately they're uh, quite expensive and not available in every hospital and especially not in uh, uh, low research uh, uh, settings. So in this case, predicting molecular profiles uh, from the features found in whole slide images can be quite beneficial. And then furthermore, it can be used uh, for uh, uh, predicting patient survival. Uh, also, it can be used for automating some routine tasks that pathologists perform uh, in their daily practice and they typ that typically take a lot of their time, such as uh, mitosis count or mitosis detection, uh, but also for discovering new uh, morphological biomarkers for some clinical outcomes of interest uh, and uh, uh, for uh, uh, for determining the reaction of the patient uh, to uh, to uh, therapy by uh, exploring uh, the morphological uh, biomarkers for the patients that do not respond or respond to a certain uh, therapy. Uh, there are different techniques that we use uh, here, and the most obvious choice is the supervised learning. Uh, but here we require annotations at the patch level by the pathologist. And uh, the process will typically start by a pathologist annotating some regions of interest uh, in the whole slide image. This can be, for example, uh, areas where tumor is located, uh, and then uh, we uh, we take these regions of interest, we uh, divide them into uh, small patches, uh, and then we uh, uh, train a neural network for extracting the patch embeddings. So this can be a convolutional neural network or a transformer-based network, and then this is done for each of the patches. Uh, and then on top of this, a fully connected network that will make a prediction at the patch level. So we do this for each of the individual patches, but then we aggregate the patch predictions uh, to the whole slide image level, which can be done by 
uh, simple averaging or majority voting, for example, depending on the task that is being done uh, in order to obtain the, to obtain uh, a false high image prediction. For example, in this case, uh, this was a tumor uh, segmentation. However, the problem with the supervised learning uh, is that it uh, requires a lot of effort from the pathologist, and this is the major reason why uh, uh, we don't have available a large scale annotated uh, data set so far. Then another approach is to use the multiple instance learning, uh, where uh, typically we'll uh, uh, can treat the whole slide image uh, as a collection of uh, instances where each patch will be a single instance. And in this case, we need only annotations at the whole slide image, image level. We don't need annotations at the uh, patch level. And this is the information that we usually have. This is uh, usually the patient diagnosis. Uh, so uh, we start by uh, sampling a number of patches from the whole slide image. Again, training a network to extract features or patch embeddings uh, for each of the patches, similar as in the supervised learning way. But now we don't make predictions for each of the patches, but we aggregate the patches to get the embedding at the whole side, whole side image level. And again, this can be done in different ways, uh, ranging from simple averaging uh, to uh, using, for example, attention mechanism. Uh, in order uh, to assign attention scores uh, uh, to the patches uh, that, uh, or larger attention scores to the patches that would contribute more to making a prediction. And finally, then we use this whole side image embedding uh, to uh, uh, make a prediction at the whole side image level. Uh, then we can use different transfer learning strategies, uh, and here we would like to transfer the knowledge uh, from the domains where data might be more available. So again, here we uh, have uh, different types of transfer learning. So uh, we can go for out-of-domain transfer learning, where typically we would use the domain of uh, natural images, because there we have much more data available. Uh, and with these, we would like to evaluate the generalizability of out-of-domain image representations when they are transferred to the domain of histopathological images. And then another approach to use uh, is to use in-domain transfer learning, uh, where we are going to pre-train the model on multiple data sets, either annotated or non-annotated data sets of histopathological images, uh, but they're used for completely different uh, tasks with different types of uh, annotations, if they exist at all, uh, and uh, uh, which are difficult to combine together. And here we can use either self-supervised learning approaches or multitask learning, learning approaches to combine them. So I will first start with the out-of-domain transfer learning. In both cases, we have the same problem that we want to solve. So the problem is that we have a lack of annotated data sets. And in case of out-of-domain transfer learning, we are going to solve this by pre-training the models in the domain of uh, natural images. Uh, and here, a typical way would be to use images, uh, models that are pre-trained on ImageNet, uh, which contains uh, millions of images uh, classified uh, into 1,000 classes. And some of the classes you can see here, so obviously, this is very distant uh, from a domain of uh, uh, hist histopathology, but we are hoping here that at the very low level, the image features might be shared uh, to some extent across different domains. Uh, so what we do here is that we uh, use the models pre-trained on ImageNet, we unfreeze the layers of the neural network, uh, we then uh, retrain these or fine tune these uh, on uh, the target histopathological data set of interest, replace the classification head uh, with the classification head that would uh, classify into our uh, classes of interest. Uh, then another solution is to use domain specific pre training. 
uh, where we want to use uh, uh, multiple small size and medium size data sets, which can be either annotated or non annotated. And this will be data that comes from uh, different organs uh, with different types of staining, uh, different resolution. And now the question is how to combine all these data together. Uh, and uh, one solution is to use uh, a self supervised uh, learning. Uh, in this case, we uh, combine all of the data sets together, but then we need to invent a task which will be common for all of these uh, data sets. And this task can come from the uh, histopathology domain. For example, this can be uh, uh, just predicting, predicting the magnification level. So it needs to be a task that does not require the pathologist to annotate it. But again, this can be also tasks uh, that uh, are completely artificial and that have nothing to do with um, uh, histopathology. These are usually known as the so-called pretext uh, tasks. And then another approach is to use multitask learning. Uh, here we would require multiple annotated data sets, but again for different tasks. And then we will train them jointly. And I will go through each of these uh, techniques in a little bit more details. So for the self-supervised learning, uh, we can again discriminate between uh, uh, two major approaches, and these are contrastive and non-contrastive learning techniques. And for the contrastive learning, uh, we uh, basically create uh, 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 two augmented or multiple augmented copies uh, of each of the tiles. And in this case, for these tiles, the, this would be, let's say, two positive examples. So uh, we have uh, two uh, core augmentations in this case here, uh, and probably some rotation as well. Uh, and then we also do the same uh, for uh, all other patches uh, that belong to the same batch. And then we train a neural network that uh, should uh, emphasize the similarity uh, between the patches uh, that uh, come from the same origin and uh, emphasize this similarity uh, to uh, all the augmented patches that come from a different origin by uh, putting in the feature space, in the embedding space, uh, uh, these two uh, uh, image embeddings close to each other and all of the others uh, will be more distant uh, to each other. And this is done by uh, a careful choice of the uh, loss function. And here we use the models that are uh, pre-trained uh, on uh, 57 unannotated data sets of histopathological images that come from uh, 22 different organs uh, and uh, uh, two backbone networks uh, are uh, used uh, to train uh, the models. Then for the non-contrastive learning, we use the uh, technique which is known under the name Bootstrap Your Own Latent or uh, abbreviated uh, BIO. Uh, and this does not require any negative examples. So here previously we had some positive examples and we had some negative examples and we were comparing positive to negative. Here we need only positive examples. So again, we make two augmentations of the same image. So the first one is uh, cropping and the second one would be here again, some rotation. Uh, and uh, then we train two networks on these two augmented versions of the same patch. Uh, these two networks have exactly the same architecture, uh, but different ways. Uh, and then the first one is known as the online network, and the second one is known as the target network. And now the online network in each epoch tries to predict the output of the target network. But then during the backpropagation, the online network uh, will, yeah, the weights of the online network will be. Uh, updated during the back, back propagation, but the weights of the target network will actually be updated as the exponential moving average of the uh, parameters of the online network. So after each iteration, 
And then the model is uh, pre-trained on uh, more than 30,000 of whole slide images that come from the two, uh, well, let's say medium scale uh, image uh, databases, so TCGA and PAIP. Uh, with uh, 32 cancer subtypes in total and multiple organs and up to uh, 50 million of patches that are extracted uh, from these 32,000 uh, whole site uh, images. And then another approach that uh, we have uh, been working with is the multitask learning. Uh, here, uh, we had uh, 22 annotated data sets of histopathological images, uh, which were pre-trained for 22 different classification tasks uh, uh, on 22 different data sets, but with the same network. Uh, and then this network makes prediction uh, for each of these tasks in the forward propagation step. Uh, and then the loss is calculated uh, for each of these tasks, but then instead of uh, minimizing the loss for each of these tasks separately, we aggregate the loss over all of the tasks and then minimize these aggregated loss. So we actually get the parameters of the network, which are not optimal for any of the individual tasks, but are optimal for solving all of them together. And here the model was pre-trained uh, on uh, more than 800,000 of patches that come uh, from whole site images of uh, uh, tissues uh, from seven different uh, organs, and again with two different backbone networks. Uh, so these are the pre-trained models that uh, we have been using, and uh, we were we were using them uh, for several tasks. The first one was. Uh, the tumor subtype prediction, and here we tried uh, to predict uh, uh, subtypes of uh, adult type diffuse gliomas, which are uh, very aggressive and the most malignant brain uh, tumors, which historically uh, were classified according to their morphological characteristics. Uh, but more recently, uh, refinement of, of tumor classification is uh, made using their molecular profiles. And according to the latest uh, World Health uh, classification of the brain tumors, uh, diffuse gliomas are now classified uh, based on their IDH mutation status and 1P90Q codeletion status into three subtypes. These are astrocytoma, oligodendro glioma, and blastoma. And just to clarify why uh, it is important to correctly recognize the subtype, uh, these tumors are very aggressive uh, and the patient survival is uh, different in different subtypes and uh, ranges uh, from uh, several months to several years. And then correct uh, uh, diagnosis of the subtype or correct classification of the subtype will also determine uh, the uh, therapy that is uh, going to be used. So it's extremely important uh, as early as possible to determine uh, the correct uh, tumor subtype. So again, uh, we have uh, used here uh, models which were pre-trained out of domain, so on ImageNet, and which were pre-trained in domain, so either using self-supervised uh, contrastive and non-contrastive learning or uh, multitask learning strategies. Uh, then uh, uh, pathologists from LNS uh, have uh, annotated regions of uh, interest for each of the whole slide image. We have then extracted uh, uh, small rectangular patches from the regions of interest. Uh, the size of each patch was 512 times uh, 512 pixels. Uh, and then we have fine-tuned the previously pre-trained model uh, on uh, the target data set of interest and performed classification. Then on top of this, we have added another step of semi-supervised learning, where we wanted to uh, kind of make leverage of uh, uh, the a large amount of patches which were outside of the regions of interest and which were not, uh, which have not been used uh, for training the model. Uh, 
And I will again explain in a little bit more details in one of the following slides how this worked. Uh, and finally, after this uh, uh, second learning step, uh, we uh, provide improved prediction either for the tumor subtype prediction or for uh, uh, tumor uh, segmentation. Uh, the data that we have been working on uh, comes from the uh, diffuse bioma cases in Luxembourg uh, uh, that were uh, processed uh, at uh, uh, Luxembourg National Laboratory, so LNS. Then the regions of interest were annotated by certified pathologists at LNS. Uh, uh, then we applied some uh, image augmentation uh, to our training data uh, to uh, prevent overfitting uh, by applying flipping and rotation by three angles. And uh, then the classification is done into five classes, three of which were uh, 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 glioma subtypes. Then there was a class for the normal brain tissue, and there was also a class for the necrotic tissue which mostly appears with glioblastoma, but these are uh, usually uh, the cases of uh, more progressed glioblastoma with also uh, worse uh, survival. Uh, and uh, it was necessary to uh, have them as, as a distinct class here. So our training data after augmentation was around 130,000 of patches. And then we had around 4,000 of patches in the test data and division into training uh, and tests what was done uh, on, on the patient uh, based level. So there were no patches uh, that were uh, uh, at, the at the same time present in both training and test subsets. Uh, then the first try was to use the out of domain transfer learning, so pre training with ImageNet, but we also wanted to evaluate how much pre-training pre -training actually uh, yeah, improves the model performance. Uh, and uh, so just for comparison, we have first used a certain number of models, uh, so some convolutional neural networks and also transformer-based networks, so vision transformers, swing transformers, and also a hybrid network, which was a combination of ResNet 50 as a feature pre-extractor and then vision transformer on top of these uh, that were uh, not pre-trained on ImageNet. So they start that started uh, from uh, randomly initialized weights. Uh, and then we use the same models uh, with ImageNet pre-training where uh, they were fine-tuned uh, on our uh, target data set of interest. So the classification head was here composed of two fully connected layers with 256 and 128 neurons, uh, respectively, with wheel activation and with uh, a dropout layer to prevent overfitting. We used the uh, Adam W optimizer with the uh, weighted categorical cross entropy loss in order to account uh, for the imbalance that was present in our data set. Uh, and uh, uh, then we trained for maximum of, of 10 epochs uh, with uh, reducing the learning rate after five epochs. And what we can observe here is that uh, pre-training uh, with ImageNet was indeed a crucial step, which uh, substantially improved the performance over all of the analyzed model, models. And this uh, improvement was uh, especially substantial when using uh, transformer-based networks uh, uh, where it went even up to 30%, for example, for the swing transformers. But this was something that was already known and expected. The uh, transformer required considerably more data to train uh, than, uh, than the convolutional neural networks. So uh, when trained with limited, limited data, the performance was uh, quite modest, but once they were exposed to large data sets, even if they come from completely different domain, then we could obtain with them either comparable performance with uh, CNS uh, or in some cases even outperforming them. 
Then we also try the in-domain transfer learning with uh, different self-supervised learning strategies and also multitask learning model, pre-trained models. Uh, and uh, here uh, we again see that uh, we have an additional gain uh, due to elim eliminating the domain mismatch between the domains of natural images and histopathology images. And again, for uh, all the models, we uh, can see improved performance in comparison to the uh, uh, same architectures that were pre-trained on ImageNet. And again, the best performance was obtained uh, uh, using the uh, combination of ResNet 50 and Vision Transformers with around 1.5% improvement. Uh, of in terms of balanced accuracy uh, in comparison to the models that were pre-trained with ImageNet. Then there was the second step of the semi-supervised learning, where again we wanted to leverage the uh, patches which were outside of the regions of interest and which were not initially used for training the model. Uh, so, our strategy here was to use the model that was initially pre-trained only on the regions of interest to use this model to classify the patches outside of the regions of interest and to assign them the so-called weak labels or pseudo-labels. Then, in the second step, to merge the data from the let's say ground truth data that was annotated by the pathologist with the uh, weekly label data that was annotated by our model. And here we also wanted to decrease uncertainty uh, by eliminating uh, uh, all uh, uh, edges which were predicted with the confidence scores that were uh, below 90% to preserve only the uh, uh, the best predicted uh, patches. With this, we were able to increase the size of the data set uh, by uh, around two to three times in comparison to the original data set. And additionally, to improve the performance of uh, all the self uh, supervised learning and multitask learning models. And this improvement <clears throat> went uh, from around 0.5% uh, for. Uh, the uh, combination of ResNet 50 and Vision Transformer to up to almost 5% uh, uh, in case when we use uh, contrastive learning with the ResNet uh, 18 uh, network. Uh, furthermore, we wanted to evaluate the performance per each of the individual classes. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, it was yeah, the model was doing quite a good job here, so this is the best performing model uh, for all of the classes, except for the oligodendral glioma class, which was in around 70% of cases swapped with the astrocytoma uh, class. And then we analyzed these uh, examples uh, with, the, with the pathologist, uh, and he confirmed us that uh, these were the cases which uh, were actually morphologically quite similar and which were challenging even for the trained pathologist. And uh, these were the cases where they would typically require additional molecular profiling in order to uh, determine uh, the uh, correct diagnosis. Uh, if we then check the uh, metrics uh, across uh, different classes, then we see that, of course, this ends up with uh, lower precision and lower recall in uh, uh, astrocytoma and oligodendral glioma, and of course, uh, a bit decreased F1 scores for these two classes because of this. Finally, we uh, wanted to go from the uh, patch level to the whole slide image level by overlaying the predicted confidence scores for each of the patches on the whole slide image as a heat map. Uh, and uh, with these, we can segment the areas where uh, tumor tissue is located. In this case, this was bioblastoma, areas with the necrotic tissue and with the normal brain tissue. 
uh, and also there are some uh, uh, incorrectly recognized uh, or predicted uh, patches of astrocytoma and uh, oligodendroglioma. Uh, and again, the, the major idea of this was not to replace the pathologies because this will never happen, but uh, to uh, assist the pathologist to draw his attentions, uh, attention to the most informative areas where he needs uh, or he should pay uh, more attention to. Okay, so this was the first or first two use cases. Then another use case uh, is uh, molecular profile prediction, and this is something that we just recently started. So I can present here only some preliminary results. Uh, here we have been working on publicly available GTEx dataset uh, and uh, on uh, pairs of uh, uh, RNA-seq data, so transcriptomics, uh, uh, and the whole slide images that, uh, that come from the uh, uh, same uh, uh, tissue specimen. Uh, and uh, the data set uh, that have, we have been working on contains data from more than 670 patients, data coming from 27 different organs. Uh, and here on one hand, we have extracted the molecular profiles uh, from the RNA-seq data uh, using uh, consensus independent component analysis, which decomposes the input matrix into two matrices, one uh, that provides uh, a functional annotation and can identify, for example, biological processes or cell types, and another one that provides the weights, which we basically use as uh, molecular features and which are more linked uh, to patient uh, uh, data. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, using some of the techniques that I had just presented, uh, uh, we extract uh, image embeddings from the whole side images. And then uh, uh, I show here only the clustering based on the embeddings extracted for each of the patches. So this is just from the image. This is not from the uh, omics data. Uh, and we see that we can find some clusters uh, based on the uh, uh, tissue of origin here. These clusters are not very well defined. But once we go from the patch level and average uh, all patch embeddings into whole side image embedding, we get uh, much uh, better defined clusters. Uh, and they're actually uh, quite similar uh, to the clusters that we can get uh, using the uh, molecular profiles or ICA weights extracted from the RNA-seq data. And this actually motivated us to try to predict molecular profiles uh, directly uh, from the uh, features extracted from the whole side images. Again, uh, we tried here to do uh, the prediction of the uh, organ of origin uh, from the whole side image. And in this case, we can use the uh, latest pre-trained uh, model, uh, which was trained on more than 100,000 of uh, whole side images and uh, multiple millions of patches extracted from these uh, images. Uh, and we see that we uh, get uh, quite comparable performance to the performance uh, uh, of the molecular weights. And even uh, these two are struggling at exactly uh, the same place. So we see that uh, we see similar behavior here for uh, a bladder tissue or again for, for the breast tissue, which again, uh, has motivated us to see whether we can uh, predict molecular profiles uh, from, from the whole site image embeddings. And this was just the first try here where we predicted each of the ICA components uh, uh, from the whole site image after five uh, times uh, uh, cross-validation, five-fold cross-validation. And here we see that we get quite a reasonable coefficient of uh, determination. So R squared was around 0 0.7. Uh, and uh, we can see how actually it was distributed across different 
ICA components where some of them uh, were uh, quite well predicted and okay, we have also some of them with uh, uh, all over R squared. So we need to dive deeply, more deeply into these to also uh, see the uh, biological interpretation for each of these components and to better understand uh, uh, what we can and what we cannot uh, predict uh, well uh, from the morphological features in uh, whole site images. So this is exactly the direction we would like, where we would like to go further. So we want to go towards multimodal fusion of uh, image embeddings with uh, uh, omics features and also clinical data for improved uh, prediction in comparison to the uh, each of the individual modalities, but also for predicting for, for predicting molecular profiles uh, uh, from the morphological features found in whole slide images. Uh, and then another direction that we are very much interested in is uh, the vision language models, where we would use models that are trained on pairs uh, of uh, uh, patches extracted from the whole slide images and text explanations uh, that can come, for example, from medical textbooks for these patches. And these can be further used for automatic generation of uh, structured pathology reports. Again, the idea comes here from the pathologies that we have been speaking to, uh, where uh, they told us that uh, sometimes they uh, need not more than 10, 15 seconds to make a diagnosis, but uh, they need 15 or more minutes uh, to write a report and then having a draft report that they could go through and only correct it would uh, uh, save substantially some of their time. Uh, again, I would just li like at the end to take a look at some of the unresolved challenges in digital pathology community, which are the major reason why, uh, why only several works in digital pathology have made the clinical input so far. Uh, and to my knowledge, there is uh, only F one FDA approved clinical grade AS solution. This is for prostate cancer detection, and only several of them received the C marks uh, in European Union. And the major reason for, well, not yet widespread adoption uh, of uh, uh, these tools in clinical settings is, uh, first of all, some limitations that do exist, uh, and the major one is the uh, data site, uh, data set size, which is still relatively small compared to the diversity with, uh, within the given data, but also the biases due to the use of different equipment, for example, uh, different scanners or also different staining techniques, or even for the same staining, uh, if uh, different technicians are doing these, uh, you can get uh, pretty much uh, different outputs. Uh, also, it doesn't help that uh, regulatory bodies still do not have extensive experience with the AI software, uh, but this is something that uh, recently uh, uh, changes a lot. Uh, it's not exactly my area of expertise, but I'm aware, of course, of the AI Act that, uh, uh, that was uh, published recently and that will uh, most likely uh, push towards uh, more certification of uh, uh, AI-based uh, uh, clinical tools. So with this, I would like to uh, finish my presentation uh, and to thank to uh, uh, my collaborators at the Bioinformatics and AI unit, uh, so Dr. Peter Nazarov and Sang Yun Kim, but also uh, our collaborators at the National Center of Pathology and Cancer, Cancer Institute, uh, Michel Mittelbron, Katrin Frauenknecht, Anne Christine Howe, and uh, Felix Kleineborgman, who helped us a lot uh, with uh, annotating the data. So, thank you very much for your attention. I hope I was not so long, uh, and I'm, of course, happy to take uh, any of your questions. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Vladimir, for this a very broad and uh, also deep uh, presentation, uh, which I believe was of uh, interest to many of us. 
So let's let me open the question part of the seminar. Um, whoever wants to ask questions, as usually, either switch on your mic or raise your hand. And okay, I can see one question. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for the very nice presentation. Um, my question is about the whole slide images and the patchification. What happens on the boundaries of a tumor? For example, where we have a patch that could contain a tumor part and a normal tissue. How have you handled that? And also well, your opinion about using multi-label classification uh, in this regard instead of multi-class classification. Uh, yes, uh, well, that, that is certainly a problem. And uh, when uh, pathologists are annotating the whole site images, they're basically trying to annotate uh, the areas uh, uh, where where the tumor is quite distinct uh, from the surrounding tissue. But of course, it happens that at the boundaries, we uh, might have examples uh, where we, we have these infiltrations uh, and uh, in this case we do not provide uh, or we do not do any additional processing. Uh, this is uh, a certain level of noise that uh, the model uh, has to deal with uh, and uh, as we can see, it mostly is able to deal with most of these. It's uh, very much important uh, how precise the annotation is done. And uh, uh, during the sessions with the pathologists, we also discussed these and uh, try, tried to uh, uh, do it in the way that uh, we get as uh, low uh, number of uh, examples with these kind of infiltrations as, as possible but of course it can it can it can happen thank you um andreas please go ahead yeah, first of all Vladimir, thank you very much for the as usual great presentation it was really nice to see what you're working on currently um, I have a question regarding uh, the current um, always question about transformers versus CNNs, where I did quite some interesting experiments. And um, first of all, I saw on slide 19 that the simple VGG, VGG model had a quite striking performance in F1 score. And I think F1 is a very good summary metric when you only want to look to one score. Um, first of all, I would be interested if you have an idea why VGG performed so well. Well, uh, I would say VGG is uh, quite a deep model, so this is probably yeah. the deepest out of all the models that we uh, have here. And uh, with its complex architecture, it is probably capable of uh, capturing the patterns that can be found in the in the data. It was also uh, very expensive to to train it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, yeah, as, as you can see here, vision transformers uh, require a lot of data for training. So uh, without pre-training step, uh, it's very difficult for them to cope with the uh, convolutional neural networks. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also an interesting paper that was, uh, so it's not in the pathology domain, so it's just in the vision, computer vision domain that was actually comparing uh, what were the outputs of the different layers of the vision transformers and of the uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, and then the uh, lower layers, and then what happens when these are trained with smaller amounts of data and with larger amounts of data. And then uh, the uh, lower levels of, of transformers were actually able uh, to capture similar features or let's say a, a local based feature as the CNN networks. But then uh, the higher transformer levels were capturing more global data, but only in cases when a large amount of data was available for training. So these were the cases where they were able to outperform convolutional neural network convolutional neural networks. Otherwise on the a relatively limited size data set CNNs usually performed uh, better. 
Yeah, so it's pretty in line with my expectations. I was also thinking about it would be interesting this table to see the number of parameters of the models because I was also thinking right. EGG is very high on parameters. And it seems a bit the models with the most parameters won because I get the ResNet plus the VIT also has the most parameters uh, versus the ResNet only. And so it's essentially where you spend the most compute that won, but it's not so much about the transformer versus the CNN maybe, because the CNN might have exactly the right inductive bias for these problems, where the transformers with this inductive bias of uh, permutation invariance is not perfectly fitting to the problem, and then can learn it with a lot of par uh, parameters, but you might, uh, might have to spend much more compute to first learn the biases that the CNN has a priori anyway. That's so, but, uh, I shared even this analysis in, in the paper that we have recently published, but it couldn't go into presentation because it was always... Uh, yeah, 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 it's a super interesting experience here. Yes. I mean, yes, yes, yes. Really but, yeah, we can, I would be happy to discuss this further. And maybe one technical question, which frameworks are you currently using to do all this, I mean, on the technical implementation level? PyTorch, PyTorch. You have PyTorch or something like Monai or uh, it's like... Uh, uh, no, well, uh, we tried Monai only for the multiple instance learning that I have not presented here, but in general, we use the plain PyTorch. Okay, crazy. That's, that's all. We have first pre processed the data. So uh, we actually start uh, from the image patches uh, that are already pre processed. We just throw them and then we train the models in the plain PyTorch. Great. Cool. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Lars. Uh... Hello, uh, thanks for your presentation, Vladimir. Um, I have, I guess my question is, you can never make your machine learning perfectly accurate, right? So when you want to use it in, let's say, clinical practice, do you want to make sure then that you have more false positives so that the radiologist or whoever has to go through only the ones that are marked as sick, let's say? Uh, Do you understand yes. what I mean? Can, can, you, can you please repeat the question? Once yes. More? Um, you can never be, you will never be perfectly accurate. So roughly speaking, how do you make sure that no, um, that nothing slips through the cracks? Uh, well, yes, it's, it's sure with more false positives, we are going to uh, have, uh, lower precision, uh, we cannot make it completely sure that's, as you said, we are not able to have perfect models. Even if I show here the performance, which looks quite well, uh, if uh, we are uh, uh, completely, we cannot be completely certain that once this is transferred or evaluated on a different data set, we are going to get the same level of performance. This is not going to happen uh, because here we have been working only with the whole slide images there that are scanned with a single scanner. We also want to increase now our data set that as we will have available data with scanned with two different scanners and LNS. Uh, and uh, this will increase also the variability in our data set and hopefully uh, we will have is in with these more generalizable models. Uh, but yes, it is not possible to have a perfect prediction and uh, uh, it is not possible to eliminate uh, either false or false positives or false negatives from, from our no, I, I understand that, but my question is more, um, well, if you have more false positives, so if you state of too much that it's wrong, and it will, then it, and assuming that it will always encapsulate, um, no, sorry, let me reformulate. If you have a, a certain number of sick 
indications for sick. I guess you want to have more false positives that you have slightly too much um, indications for um, certain patients that they are sick so that the pathologist or the radiologist only has to look at the ones that are marked as sick. Is there, I assume, is, is that the way to go? And, and if so, is there a way how you can enforce that you have more false positives? Uh, well, this is something that we have not dealt with uh, so far. Uh, what we could see from our predictions at the, at the class level, mm -hmm. uh, if we would only classify into tumor and non-tumor, so meaning that, uh, that uh, our classifier will combine all of the tumor classes together and then we have a normal class, then we are going to see that our classifier is going to work almost perfectly, meaning that it is separating very well between the healthy cases and between the tumor cases. Where it struggles more is discriminating between different tumor subtypes. So I don't think it's a huge issue here to discriminate between healthy and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and cases. But again, a much bigger issue is how to discriminate between the cases that are morphologically or tumor subtypes that are morphologically very similar uh, to, to each other. And this is something which is uh, very difficult to avoid uh, simply because uh, uh, what the network sees is pretty much the same with the, what the pathologist can see as well. Yeah, and uh, we do not have here uh, the uh, consistent uh, uh, diagnosis among different pathologies. So if, if you, you would ask 10 different pathologies for very difficult cases, they would probably not have a common diagnosis on this case. And this is the reason why they would need to undergo then ad additional molecular profiling in order to determine the correct diagnosis. So uh this might or should have been addressed but again for the model it, i would say it's much less problem to discriminate this binary decision between between uh, cases and healthy subjects okay thank you uh, i have uh andreas i can see that you wanted to have a comment a brief follow-up on that i mean maybe you could claim human level performance i guess right it seems you are on human level performance when doing vision only and the question is where exactly is the human level and then it's always super hard but if not impossible to prove to be better that's true and in this prestigious case here you might because you might have uh, non-causal information from the materialization profiles that would also be a question for me because I'm also an imaging guy, but it, it seems a bit the trend is that maybe pathologists in a few years might not use in, imaging anymore, but completely rely on materialization. Um, I think Michel Middlepon is a big fan because he was a co-author on this big paper that made the breakthrough on that, but I am, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, the, that's only partly true. I think this is feasible uh, only in the settings where you have resources for that, but I don't think this is going to be the case for every single country. So in low-income countries, probably it will take much more time where uh, this will be a standard procedure that would be done for every every single case. So uh, it is a way towards uh, the community is going, that's for sure. But uh, given the limited resources, I don't think this is going to be the case uh, for every hospital and especially not for every every country. Uh, uh, Vladimir, I have a question about the um, multimodal uh, part of your presentation. You, you mentioned this uh, uh, on several occasions, um, but uh, you mostly focused on these multimodal model outputs, I believe. And uh, my question is if we are going to towards the patient-specific uh, uh, therapy, 
perhaps a, a wider context, uh, which can be of multimodal nature, could be useful here to better classify the, the types of, of cancer, for instance. Uh, for instance, not, not to have only the images, but also some uh, prior diagnosis or uh, some comments that could be, or other types of data that could be use, used to find, or to, to, to increase the precision of prediction. The question is whether so yeah this is uh, this is something that we can discuss now the question is here if you can already have uh, uh, a perfect decision based on molecular profiling whether do you need it all oh, this is what Andreas also uh, mentioned previously do you need another modality in this case so do you need to combine imaging with uh, with uh, uh, molecular profiling in, in case you can identify genetic alterations that are causing the tumor, then you can do only the molecular profiling. You, know, you don't need the other one. So in this case, we are more interested in predicting the molecular profiles from the imaging features because imaging is cheap and uh, molecular assays are expensive so then we could with lower resources come to the solution where we can actually have close performance uh, one to another uh, i'm not sure that using for example imaging together with molecular profiling would make in that in that case uh, too much sense to do uh, there is a recent uh, paper published in Nature Medicine, which went another way, actually. Uh, they were uh, predicting uh, uh, DNA methylation from the images. And then uh, from these predicted DNA methylation levels, they were further uh, predicting uh, the tumor subtypes. And then they have shown that uh, by uh, using this uh, kind of indirect approach, they were able to provide better prediction than the case when uh, they were using only imaging features. So, so I think this can kind of be the direction, uh, maybe a better direction uh, to go in, 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 at least in digital pathology, but it would make probably much more sense if you can do this preoperatively, for example, then you would use uh, other imaging modalities such as MRI, and then it would make much more sense to combine these with uh, additional modalities where actually you can uh, uh, predict in advance before you actually uh, uh, take the tissue during the surgery. Okay, thank you. I have another question uh, in this uh, for this use case. Um, why did you decide to uh, predict the uh, IC weights? Uh, have okay. you tried? Have you tried to predict the RNA sequence profile directly? Uh, yeah, that that would be one of the questions. The other would like the would the other would be if you do predict the ICA uh, ICA uh, weight. Um, is there a way? to go back to the transcriptomics data without yes. knowing the signals. Yes, this, is, uh, this part was done by, uh, by Peter and Zaro, and the major reason was also the dimensionality of the transcriptomic data, where here in this case, we would have around 20,000 of features corresponding to uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the number of genes. Uh, and uh, if we apply, we tried here PCA and we tried uh, ICA, uh, then we substantially decrease the dimensionality and capture uh, more or less uh, similar information with only, in this case, we were using uh, 100 ICA uh, components only. And uh, then if we compare ICA with PCA, with ICA, we were able to capture more uh, biologically meaningful signals, uh, meaning that we could assign uh, search, certain uh, biological explanation to each of the ICA components. Uh, so uh, it was 
biologically more meaningful to use uh, ICA in comparison to, to PCA. But yeah, the dimensionality uh, problem with uh, working directly on the transcriptomic data, and then again, the possibility to give uh, biological interpretation uh, using the uh, uh, Independent component analysis was a major driver to uh, choose uh, ICA for extracting the molecular embeddings. Um, okay, and um, how? So, but you, but you, but then it's hard to go back to the original transcriptomics data, right? I guess, uh, like, can you really uh, do that and? Um, Otherwise, like, can you use these uh, predictions, this predicted ICA to in turn predict uh, the, a diagnosis, for example, or? Well, you can basically, yes. So, with, uh, so here the matrix of weights will basically give you for each of the samples, it will uh, give you uh, a certain feature vector that uh, characterizes uh, the original sample that comes from the transcriptomic data. So you can, of course, uh, use it for making uh, further predictions. Uh, and as I said, with the matrix of signals, you can provide functional annotations for each uh, of the uh, sample feature vectors uh, that are found in the matrix of weights. And then each of them will have a biological interpretation, uh, be it a certain uh, uh, biological process or 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 uh, or a cell type that can be identified uh, by the matrix of signals here. Okay, and have you have you tried to do like uh, predictions from this predicted data? Well, at the moment, as I said, this is kind of only preliminary work. This is something that we have recently started. We just tried a relatively simple task here. So here, just to predict uh, the organ of origin from the molecular profiles. Uh, uh, this does not have uh, uh, much of the biological importance at the moment, uh, but we just wanted to see a single comparison uh, between the uh, features that we can extract from the transcriptomics data and features that we can extract from the images, meaning that we are able actually to capture similar inf uh, information with two of the modalities. We need to dive much deeper into this and also to define uh, uh, more biologically meaningful tasks. And this is something that we are going to certainly uh, do more in the future. But uh, as I said, this is a relatively recent project that we had started. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was, I, I didn't mean if you can use the ICA weights ex extracted from the RNA sequencing, but rather the ICA weights that you predict from the imaging. So that like you have the imaging, you predict the ICA weights, yes. and from there you can still, I guess, make predictions. Uh, about different things, like, for example, this small task. Um, have you tried that and compared it to, or have you, are you uh, thinking about doing this uh, comparison of, like, using the ICA weights uh, directly extracted from the RNA-seq versus the ICA weights um, predicted from the um, imaging? Yes, this is, uh, this is one of the directions that we are going to go to, and, uh, yeah, these recent paper that I have mentioned is doing kind of a similar thing, although they're not doing this for the ICA, from the ICA weights, but uh, doing this uh, directly from the transcriptomic uh, uh, data predicted, or it was not transcriptomic in this case, it was DNA methylation predicted uh, uh, from the imaging features. We are going to take kind of a similar direction here, where indirectly by predicting the ICA weights, we want to try also to predict a certain outcome of interest and to see whether we can provide better prediction with these than uh, with uh, direct prediction from the image embeddings only. 
Uh, but yeah, we didn't have time yet to try that, but we will try that certainly for sure. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we should be slowly finishing the meeting. Uh, thank you very much, Vladimir, for uh, the very clear and rich presentation and for answering all the questions. And thank you all for, for participating in the discussion. Um, Vladimir, if I can ask you to send me some uh, references that I, so I can put them on the website, maybe it will be then um, easier for uh, everybody to read more if they want to. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yes, yes, sure. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure again to, to talk at your machine learning seminars. So the name is not Legato anymore or is it still? Well, it was never uh, Legato, but uh, I mean, as a name, right? It was within the Legato team and now, now I'm outside the Legato team, but Elisa is still in. So we, we are continuing uh, this um, further. I think it's it's quite useful to build this community and uh, to connect many groups uh, from different uh, uh, universities and from academia and from industry. So that the, that's the main goal. Uh, so thank you very much for your contribution today. Thank you. Uh, okay. Have a good day to everybody, and let me let me finish the the meeting. Thank you. Have a nice day.